This is a story about life on planet Earth. The life we all share and have in common. Our species has come a long way in a very short amount of time. What really set us apart was our ability to wield fire. Over all other creatures, we were able to successfully use fire to cook, stay warm, and defend ourselves, creating a comfortable cushion between our daily reality and the harsh elements of nature. As our brains developed and our skills improved, we started to thrive. In fact, we did so well that we pulled out ahead. As we continued to advance, however, that gap became bigger and bigger to where we now look at nature as something separate from us. The question now becomes, how can we prosper on this living, breathing planet of ours and not burn her down? How can we bring balance to our impressive growth so we can stay healthy and preserve this planet of ours for generations to come? In order to fully understand this, there is only one place to go. Back to our origins. Our journey begins in a cave at the southwestern tip of Africa, a cave which was most likely home to some of our first human ancestors. This would quite possibly have been one of the caves where one of the first human families lived in this very difficult ice age time. And they lived here trapped in this ice age for 60,000 years. And then that ice age receded and these families went on to explore the whole planet and they became every nation on the planet today. Every human on the planet shares a genetic history that connects us with these ancient ancestors. When you look at the history of the evolution of society, you'll find it was always coastal societies that had the most progress the fastest. One of the reasons for this is that they were eating fish. From an evolutionary perspective, when we started getting more omega-3 fats, it allowed our brains to grow bigger, but they didn't just grow bigger. There's something you do when you learn, and it's called myelination. And this is the ability to insulate nerves in the brain. Myelin is made out of fat. And when you eat enough fat, it's actually easier to learn because you have the raw building blocks to insulate a nerve. Yeah, I'm in the cradle of our species, Homo sapiens, the place also where later on, about a hundred thousand years ago, there seemed to be this enormous shift in the, in the brain, enormous shift in consciousness, which kind of exploded into art and ceremony and all sorts of extraordinary things. This was the home of the Khoi and the San, the original Bushmen and woman of Southern Africa. It wasn't until the 1600s when the European settlers started to colonize the Cape that they were driven from this bountiful home to a less inhabitable area such as the Kalahari Desert. Yes, they became extremely efficient at surviving there, but it was adaptation due to necessity, coupled with an unbroken chain of aboriginal wisdom of the plants, the animals, and the earth as a whole. The Bushman live from eight and in a tear. The hard, the sun, the wind, the suffered mens om die natuur te respecteer. Dis waar ons ons lewe uitmaak om saam met die natuur te lewe. Our technology has been core to how we evolved. One of the best uses of technology ever has been cooking. When we were still living in caves, when we first discovered fire, we learned how to cook so we could unlock more nutrition from foods that were really not very edible when they were raw. So that helped to fuel our brains. And as our brains got bigger, we learned to make better technologies. 
as we've become technological, we've moved away from the home fire, from the campfire, well thought about, well used, logical applications for fire into using fire to run steam engines, eventually going to stronger and stronger fuels, coal, petroleum, nuclear. Yet the wisdom and the intelligence has been lost. We're not thinking ahead. We're using a short-term gain at the expense of a long-term tragedy. And this is where we have to start bringing that ancient old brand new together. We can have technology as long as it's well thought out, as long as it's well intended. We can have this amazing life that we have on our planet sustainably if we get smart, if we get clever. This technology is getting more and more efficient, but it's getting more and more destructive in a way. It's improving dramatically, exponentially, you can even say, but the rate at which it expands is not equal to the rate at which it improves nature around it as well, because all things in technology at one stage was part of nature, whether you like to know it or not, that's the actual truth. Our ability to wield fire is a clear symbol of our fast progression as a species, becoming the dominant predator on this planet today. It drove us to excel and put us into orbit. It was the fuel of industrialization and continues in our incredible technological advancements of today. It has taken us to amazing places and back, but that very fire is on the verge of burning us. Having touched the roots of humanity at the Cape of Good Hope, our quest drove us further inland to a part of Africa that remains wild, in search for deeper understanding of our origins in nature in her purest and most primal form. The remote tribal concession of Makuleke within the Kruger National Park of South Africa is nestled between the borders of Zimbabwe and Mozambique. A wilderness education group called Eco Training gave us the privileged and rare opportunity to come and learn from the incredible raw nature that remains in Africa. We're about to go take a, about a four hour walk on our first day and just kind of get oriented and figure out what we're doing. Um, it's, uh, it's so quiet yet so loud. It's, it's, it's quite a phenomenon. Let's go out there and have some fun. As we were new to this knowledge and etiquette of walking in the wild, for our safety, we were taught to handle rifles. This was a precaution of last resort in order to protect our own lives. Fortunately, we never needed them. Along with the incredible, majestic beauty and abundance of wildlife, we were taught to walk freely amongst the big five. Lions, leopards, elephants, rhino, and buffalo are lethally dangerous animals if approached in the wrong manner. These are among the most dangerous animals in the world, yet the goal was to learn to blend into their habitat and move in harmony with them. Uh, the amount of attention you have to put into situational awareness is incredible because you're watching the tracks, you're watching all around you, you're listening to the birds, there's a lot going on. So it's, uh, it's, it's a challenge, it's, it's very, very cool. Surviving in the wild is all about situational awareness. This heightens all senses, which ends up making us feel a part of life and so much more alive and connected to the world we live in. Intuition may be a sixth sense, but out here, when every move means life or death, you learn to become keenly aware of the language of nature. I've been tracking these buffalo for about a good hour and a half now. I'm just trying to get around them because if they alert into our presence, Survival is everywhere, but so is symbiosis. Both keep us alive, and both are critically important to life itself. We've also been dragging an elephant. You see the two oh, on the ground?
It was amazing being out here. Up with the sun and out in the bush all day, we adventured into different areas, watching the animals and learning their behavior in a way that our ancestors did for millennia. The sand people um, knew something that we should not forget. They, they, they understood a sustainability for the earth. Uh, their priorities were, were in the right place. There was complete respect. And through that, they developed remedies, herbs, um, hunting techniques, which in modern society is completely alien. I believe to, to understand our present and to map our future, we need to go back in time and back to those settings and connect with, with our inner bushman, if you like. This wisdom was found amongst all indigenous Aboriginal cultures around the world who lived in the balance of nature, including the Native Americans back home. So one of the amazing concepts of the Native Americans was the idea that what you're doing today should be sustainable, not just for you and your generation, but for the next generation, the next generation, the next generation. They looked out seven generations to determine if the action they were participating in would be sustainable for their grandchildren's grandchildren, grandchildren, seven generations out. Now, that makes too much sense to ignore. We've been so caught up in our progress that we've forgotten some of the core wisdom of our species. A wisdom that teaches us to preserve this good earth for the generations to come. I think in the, in the cities, there's, there's a lot to learn from other people, but everything is, everything is complex. What I like about nature is it's simple and basic. And there has to be a balance in life between the two, but I don't think we have that balance. And I think we need to spend more time in nature and feeling closer to it. It first has to start from within. I think uh, what a wilderness experience does for the majority of people, and, uh, and there's very few people that return from a wilderness trail without, without a clearer understanding of themselves, not only themselves, but of their place in the world. Priorities change. You know, if you spend five or six days in the bush with a backpack on, uh, a bottle of water, uh, a t-shirt, a pair of shorts, you understand that you actually don't need a lot of stuff to make you happy. Nobody we've met has been inside this gorge. So we're going right up along the rocks, uh, just crawling across the river. If you look up, you have no idea what's coming down for a drink. It could be a buffalo, it could be a lion, it could be an elephant. And the water has hippos and crocs. So we're riding that razor's edge of fine line. And you have to remind yourself that there's hectic stuff all around because frankly, this place is so beautiful. You're walking around with a big smile on your face, just in awe. In the cities, we may not be thinking of life and death at every turn, not savoring each moment as if it may be our last. There are no elephants around blind corners, so we switch off. In a way, it seems as if we've developed a false sense of security that keeps us insulated from our primal genes, preventing us from feeling fully alive. We've evolved um, or developed into modern man as it as it is today, but there's a huge gap that's left behind. And I think that's one of the reasons we feel so lost, is because all of, our, all of our history, all of our culture, not over a few hundred years, but over tens of thousands of years, has gone. What have we lost? We live trapped in time, and here, well, time is all you've got. Time to listen, time to live in the moment, and time to contemplate life. Food is everywhere if you know what you're doing, and life seems so simple, so pure. No, no matter who you are, no matter what, you're, what you do for a living, how much money you have, or uh, what religion you are, um, if you come to the bush, everyone is on a level playing field. The ego is taken out of the equation, um, and we understand ourselves. There's an authenticity out here which we all relate to. But I think the biggest draw and the biggest uh, rejuvenation that people have is simply getting away from what is driving them to whatever is is making them tense or ill or anything like that. Take away the watch, take away time, put people in touch with this. 
for me, that's what nature does. It provides a grounding, a balance to, to understand your own strengths, your own weaknesses, um, and that authentic growth in yourself you can take to other people. Spending time out here really makes us ponder the nature of our existence in the modern world. It makes us think who we are and where we came from, and really, what is it that we're doing? How do we get into this mess where we find ourselves so stressed out and wound up? How is it that people are now lacking meaning in life when several generations ago, we were simply happy to have food on the table? What's different here? And what's changed in our modern world that makes us so crazy and so sick? So the wisdom of the ancients is truly the medicine of the future. If we can't recognize that, if we don't work in conjunction with the plants, if we try and squash over nature and not honor her, that could be the end of our health. So after an awakening month in the African bush, we returned to America. With a deeper understanding of the fine balance of nature, we decided to take it one step further. Cliff Hodges of Adventure Out has been teaching primitive skills to people of all walks of life for years. Under his expert guidance, we learned survival skills that were used by our ancestors. So in a wilderness survival situation, it's very important to separate your needs from your wants so that you can stay alive. And there's really only four things you need as a human being to survive on this planet. That's shelter, water, fire, and food. If you have those four things, you are alive. Everything else beyond those four needs is truly just a want. No matter how bad you think you need it, it's just a want. And when you're out here, living in the wilderness, living off the land, taking care of yourself with only your two hands, it really forces us as people to examine the difference between needs and wants. In a world where the media pushes new wants on us every day, maybe we need to look at our past to understand what our actual needs are. The Native Americans prided themselves on being aware. They would sit in one spot and be conscious of what the bird noises were miles away. They would feel the direction of the wind, they would sense the temperature, the barometric pressure, and they could identify where the weather changes were coming from. They were constantly looking deeper and deeper and deeper, out farther and farther and farther away from themselves, so they could see what the intelligent next move would be. Without recognizing where life is and what serves them, they didn't really want to make any movement because they were concerned about their own future. So we're an organism that feeds off the planet and we also take care of the planet and it takes care of us. If we don't continue that symbiotic cycle, then one of those two organisms becomes parasitic rather than symbiotic. And if humans act as a parasitic organism on the planet, what will happen is, essentially, the planet stops working. In many ways, our survival depends on symbiosis. Who are we in relation to all the other life that surrounds us? We need to understand the principles of survival in wilderness to, to, uh, to pick them up and transport them to our, our lives in modern society. And, and we actually don't live too separate in existence, funnily enough. We may not have a tiger chasing us anymore, but it's still the same circuitry, fight or flight, sympathetic nervous system that we have in place all the time. The instincts are exactly the same. They're exactly the same. The environment is a bit different, but it's exactly the same. We are a part of the food chain, we're part of the ecosystem, but as people, we've somehow learned to insulate ourselves from that. And it also has created us as the only animal that walks out into the woods and worries about it. You know, a deer doesn't worry about where it's gonna sleep and where it's gonna find food. Why do people? And I think these skills help people to realize that this is a part of who they are, this is part of their birthright, and they just need to remember how. For millennia, our ancestors understood changes in the signature of life as it moved around them. 
In two to three generations, we've taken a grand detour from this critical stream of information. We've unplugged from the planet. So this situational awareness, this being conscious of what your actions are doing out in the environment, and how those actions will come back to you. Are you going to be able to survive and thrive if you behave in a certain way? They're incredibly important for every aspect of not only life in the here and now, but life in the future, and life for the next generation and the seven generations after that. Human beings are the creators, the tool builders. That is what sets us apart as different animals on this planet. And I think to understand some of our original ingenuities and why we created them can help us understand why we're still creating technology and what we're using it for. It's to make our lives easier and more simple. But when you study technology in a wilderness situation, I think it really shows the glaring example of why you need to make your technology sustainable. Because out here, if you're doing something that's damaging the ecosystem, you're directly threatening your ability to live. The United Nations has recently become very vocal about climate change and the urgency of the planet's issues. We are responsible for many of these changes. Our use of the proverbial fire has gotten so out of hand that we are now choking out the planet, bringing our fight for survival back onto center stage. So where is our situational awareness? Are we hearing the alarm calls or are we ignoring our natural intelligence? Hermes Trimiscus, the ancient Greek philosopher, had a famous axiom, which is summed up by the saying, as above, so below. This principle of life suggests that the macrocosm and the microcosm are reflections of each other. And what we see on a large scale will inevitably show up on a smaller scale and vice versa. With this in mind, we need to look at the current health of our planet in order to understand what is happening in our own bodies. We're up to 74 billion pounds of chemicals being produced or imported into the United States every single day. That's 250 pounds per person per day. And you know what? That number did not even include pharmaceuticals, pesticides, fuels, and food additives. Four of the largest classes of chemicals that we know. So what are we doing? We're swimming now in chemicals. A lot of these chemicals have never been tested for safety. And we eat low levels of this every day in our food supply that we did not evolve to consume. We were designed by nature. And when you look at the rest of the animals that live as nature designed them to live, you see that they don't get sick. But we have extracted ourselves from natural conditions. And we have filled our life with chemicals. So the toxicity of our planet is rampant. Our whole environment's changed, so we're under all sorts of stresses. We're under environmental stresses from levels of pollution in our environment, from plastics we're exposed to. The average newborn baby has 287 known chemicals in their umbilical cord blood before they even take their first breath. What's upsetting to me as a dad is the recent data on air pollution. We're now seeing that air pollutants are classified as a class one carcinogen. And by the year 2050, air pollution is gonna be the primary cause of death on the globe. It's gonna beat out some of the infectious diseases. And when we hear news over in India and China about shutting down highways because there's no visibility, you say, oh, that's a good thing it's over there. But on this globe of ours, there's no away. There's no throwing something away or wishing something away because NASA's been tracking a phenomenon called the brown cloud, where the pollution over in Indonesia, China, will rise up on the dust storms and the jet stream, travel over to the United States within seven days' time, and that pollution will be deposited on the western seaboard of the United States. If it's not raining there, it continues on across the entire United States.
the toxicity of our planet is really a big part of what is causing humanity to be so sick. Look around, everybody's sick. Everybody's taking medications, going to tests, and having surgeries. What is going on? We've become so incredibly dependent on fossil fuels, using them for everything from gas to water bottles. In fact, we rushed into it so fast that we never really thought through the consequences of a world choking on plastic, polluting us and making us sick. So we're hearing all about BPA, we're hearing about phthalates, we're hearing about plastics causing problems, we're hearing that they're endocrine disruptors, what does that mean? It basically means they are pseudoestrogens, they have hormone signaling powers in the human body and they take place at minute amounts. We're producing about six billion pounds of BPA every single year. We use it in our plastic bottles. It's a softening agent. It's what's called a plasticizing agent. Phthalates is another plasticizing agent. You know where we use that? We're using it in sunscreens. We're using it in lotions. When you combine what those chemicals do as synthetic estrogens directly to your body, plus all of the stuff that's made by unhealthy soil exposed to these chemicals, and you put all of that in your body, you are making yourself unwell, and it's a subtle, chronic thing that happens every day. We've reached the point now that the level of estrogen signaling from these chemicals is higher than the hormones that our kids are producing from their own organs. Your hormones are part of the master signaling in your body. When they're off, entire systems are off. Here's what happens. You feel anxious, you gain weight, you're infertile, you feel tired. It used to be the case that humans were naturally lean and athletic and strong. Now we see weakness all around us. What is that? Why are people obese? Why aren't they able to do everything they want to do? There's only so much we can tolerate. And as we build up toxic exposure, toxic exposure, toxic exposure, we hit a threshold in which we can no longer function. Our body is too busy trying to manage the toxins and it can't carry on normal function. We're poisoning ourselves, we're poisoning the environment, we're getting fat, sick, tired, and depressed, and more unhealthy by the decade. Maybe our weight gain and the fact that we're poisoning ourselves and our environment are much more related than people think. We now see a connection between these toxins and the obesity epidemic. So here's what happens. When you try to lose weight, when you go on a diet, these endocrine disruptors, the toxins that are in your fat, get released. You're burning the fat, it's like these endocrine disruptors get out of jail. So your blood levels go up and it starts to make you store fat again. We all handle fire every day. From the alarm clock that wakes us up to the heated water in our showers, the electrical and mechanical items in our world are driven by energy and we've grown to take it for granted. Do we get rid of it all? No, technology is here to stay. But is it from a clean or a dirty source? Did people die getting you your coffee? What's the cost? Are you a slave to your tech? We're at a place where we need a fundamental rethinking of how we use technology. So if you replace the word fire with technology, perhaps you'll understand that we have a massive responsibility. Yes, we're incredibly intelligent. Yes, we can manipulate the entire planet with our mind. But I think we need to consider what the planet really is. The planet is an ecosystem of life, and we are part of that ecosystem. In Africa, we found the roots of our species in an environment that fed and nourished us. The plants, the animals, and the conditions that gave birth to humanity. Those healthy roots helped us flourish, and now, with our modern departure from the purity of that environment, we're driven to take a journey back to our own root, the actual root of our bodies. Yeah, any, any good gardener that you follow around, when they see an unhealthy looking tree, discolored leaves and fruit that's not thriving and flowers that are not shiny, they don't spend too much time looking at the leaves, the fruit, and the flowers. They go and take a look at the roots and the soil around them. Our gut 
is like the roots of a plant, is where our organism extracts and absorbs nutrients and send them to the rest of the organism. Everything in this world is nature. From the enormous elephants that roam in the wild to the microscopic bacteria that live inside of us. And with this understanding of as above, so below, both are equally important in this great web of life and we can't separate our parts without looking at the whole in everything. The medicine that we have today is based on outdated 19th and 20th century ideas. If you had a headache, you went to the head doctor. If you had a stomach ache, you went to the stomach doctor. Then medicine got organized in these specialties. The problem is these specialties have nothing to do with the way the body is truly organized. And as the science advances, as we understand the body as an integrated system, as an ecosystem, all those ways of framing disease become more and more irrelevant. An ecosystem a biological community of interacting organisms and their physical environment. The microbiome is your inner ecosystem. And it starts with your mouth, your nose, you've got bacteria and fungi throughout your body. And the numbers are staggering. You have 10 times as many bacteria in your body as you do human cells. So the gut microbiome, by all the researchers in the know now, is the center, the seat of the immune response. In fact, they are renaming the immune system the microbial interaction system. Nothing happens in the body without the presence of the microbiome. There are trillions of organisms in and on us, and we rely on communication with them to determine what is happening in the outside world. So studies have shown that the lack of biodiversity in the gut is what leads to things like obesity, diabetes, arthritis, and inflammation. This is where we interface with the outside world. It's where our bodies determine what substances are friend or foe and where our immune system is most active. Within the first six meters of your intestinal tract, the small intestinal area, you could have around 70% of your entire immune system. It's the window to the outside world. Science Magazine 2004 called it the inner tube of life. You have this tube that runs from one end to the next and it divides you from the outside world. So why wouldn't you, along your castle wall, also put your defenses? It makes too much sense to ignore. So if you're ever going to excite your immune system, if you ever see inflammation, as a sheer matter of odds, the first place you look is the gut. Health and disease start in the gut, start in the intestines. There is where we absorb our nutrients from. There is where our immune system checks for foreign stuff coming in and out. People are missing the bacteria in their gut. Of course, their digestion is totally wrecked. And it's a slow decline, so people don't realize that you know, over five years, 10 years, decades, that you know, they took these antibiotics multiple times for various infections, and 10, 20 years later, they're dealing with digestive issues. They don't always make that correlation. The word antibiotic has become a household term. Let's pick this apart. Anti, against, biotic, life. Against, life. Antibiotics kill your gut microbiome indiscriminately. And we're finding that not only do you kill the bad guys, you kill the good guys. We should all be concerned about the extinction of plants and especially animals on our planet. And we should also be concerned about the extinction of our friendly bacteria and the microbiology and microbiome that's inside of us. We have no idea what the effect of these antibiotics that are wholesale slaughtering our good and bad bacteria inside our body. What's the long-term effect? We don't know. I think in this very day and age, we're having a mass extinction on a smaller scale. I think we're missing a lot of the beneficial microbes that supply balance and health in our intestinal tracts. So we've made mistakes before. Why can't we learn from those lessons? What can we translate to the next generation to teach them about the mistakes that we've made before so it doesn't happen to them? Our troops are on red alert. 
constantly being bombarded with substances they don't recognize. This causes a war at the root of our being and is the basis for much of the health crisis we're having today. You know, it's not just the nasty chemicals that we're exposed to, it's also the ingredients in these new foods that our bodies have never really acclimated to. Even wheat, uh, the wheat that we eat today is nothing like the wheat that we ate 50 years ago. And there are all these ingredients in it that we haven't had time to acclimate to. When your body's reacting to foods, you have a immune response to them. And when this happens, the reaction to your body is to create inflammation. And so not only do you create inflammation, you also start to crave these very foods that are hurting you, so you'll start to eat them more and more, and now you'll have more and more inflammation. Inflammation is known and accepted to be the common underlying factor for most chronic diseases. Whether you're talking about cancer, Alzheimer's, heart disease, arthritis, autoimmune diseases, we know that years before these diseases are diagnosed, inflammation is lingering. When the digestive tract is subjected to foods it can't digest, it gets inflamed, and the resulting condition is called leaky gut, where the gut barrier gets compromised and food particles sneak through, triggering further immune response. And we're now seeing that this gut permeability, this leaky gut, is behind obesity, type 2 diabetes, even early signs of cardiovascular disease. We definitely know we have autoimmune issues. So my goodness, why wouldn't we want to keep our friends in balance? They keep us in balance. Fortunately, there are practices that have been preserved from our past that are making a strong comeback. 20 years of research in the field of health and nutrition has led us to the conclusion that you must have raw, live cultured food in your diet. That means a kimchi or a sauerkraut with real, live, friendly bacteria that's growing on it. So for example, an unpasteurized, raw, live sauerkraut has amazing effects on your immunity and the overall health of your digestive tract. So if we start out with vegetables that have been grown in healthy soil, we end up letting nature run its course. We ferment these vegetables and we eat them. It allows us to thrive symbiotically with these beneficial bacteria. Getting our relationship right with the earth starts with the life inside of us. When we have this balance, amazing things begin to happen. We start to come back to life ourselves. There's an ancient relationship with a special organism that's been working closely with us for millions of years. Early in the cellular development of life on this planet, our cells took on a particular type of bacteria, literally brought it within our own cell walls and made it an integral part of how we make energy. This tiny organelle is called mitochondria, and the currency of this energy is a molecule called adenosine triphosphate, or ATP for short. Mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. They're responsible for producing the energy of the body. ATP is the currency that your body uses to carry out hundreds of different reactions, over 300 different reactions. If you want to think a thought, if you want to feel a feeling, if you want to move a muscle, ATP is probably behind it. You know, running a life without energy is like running a business without any money. It just doesn't work. You're constantly robbing Peter to pay Paul. You're also trying to get a little bit of an edge on energy with caffeine or with something else to make up for lost sleep. And basically, you're running your life without the thing that you need most to keep it going, and that's your natural energy. It happens to be that the mitochondrial DNA is extremely susceptible to damage. It's super easy, if you're a chemical, to sneak in and harm the mitochondria. And in fact, out of the 87,000 plus industrial chemicals that are on the marketplace today, those that are researched for safety analysis, the vast majority are found to be 
mitochondrial disruptors. They inhibit or decrease the action of the mitochondria itself. Another symbiotic relationship we have with bacteria, and yet another situation where environmental toxins and unnatural foods could be harming us at a core level. Is it any wonder that most people go to the doctor complaining of low energy and depression? A lack of energy at a cellular level could explain this, but there's also a lack of a critical amino acid that we're losing access to. So many people are suffering with depression and being unhappy and sluggish. Perhaps there's a better solution like natural foods and responsible movement that could help the situation more than drugs. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter that's responsible for making you happy. Most antidepressants target serotonin. And the serotonin itself comes from tryptophan, an amino acid that comes from plants and bacteria. And we need to ingest that tryptophan. It needs to stay in a particular shape and form and get converted to serotonin so we can utilize it for thought. But unfortunately, it's very oxidant sensitive, this entire process. So if you have any toxins around, if you have not enough ATP, if you have a lot of free radicals and stress, guess what goes first? It's the tryptophan, 5-HTP, and serotonin. So unfortunately, our higher reasoning centers on this planet are under siege right now. So the prefrontal cortex is the most human thoughtful part of the brain. It's involved with things like forethought, judgment, impulse control, organization, planning, empathy, learning from the mistakes you make. And when you don't feed it right, it doesn't work nearly as well. So food is medicine or food is poison. When people clean up their diet and start to get the toxins out of their system, they wake up. They're more sensitive to the world that's happening around them. They have to believe in a better world than the one that they're used to. With a healthy brain, people are happier, physically healthier because they make better decisions. They're wealthier because they make better decisions and they're more successful. So if you want to take care of yourself and your children, and grandchildren and the world around you take care of your brain. Fixing your gut by simply eating clean food starts to replenish the serotonin reserves that you have in your body. And it's what allows us to really connect with people. The mitochondria and the trillions of friendly bacteria that are in our gut are an integral part of life. In fact, our genetic expression is very much influenced by the bacteria we coexist with. One of the most exciting scientific discoveries is that the way that you eat and move turns on and off certain genes. Now, I think this is an incredible opportunity. It's empowering because 50 to 80% of your genes and how they're expressed is determined by the way that you eat, move, and think. Literally, genes recreate, rebuild, renew, regenerate each of us on a daily basis, and, and how they do that is up to us and the signals that we choose to give them. These genes code for proteins, things like your hormones that are involved in your metabolism, your weight, your fertility, and your mood. There are 140 times more genes coming from microbes on and in our bodies than there are from our own cells. So we have this relationship where they rely on us, we rely on them, a symbiotic relationship where life for both of us could not happen without one or the other. So perhaps we could gain a little bit more mutual respect. It seems that there used to be a certain quality of life that we all enjoyed when we lived closer to nature. Inside and out, we enjoyed the benefits of better health and natural rhythms and the good bacteria that kept us vibrantly alive. So our development over time has led us to have these big, beautiful brains that can contemplate so much. But it's almost ironic that our own intelligence, our own design of synthetic compounds and industry is now bringing the decline of the brain itself. The decline of our brains? How intelligent are we if we're actively shutting down the one organ that helped us thrive?
there was something that could make you happier, healthier, and reduce your stress, make you more calm, would you do it? Because that thing exists. It's called meditation, and a lot of people aren't doing it. And you don't have to start big. You can start with just a few minutes a day, but once you build that habit, it changes your life. So many people don't know that there's actually a huge science base for the impact of meditation on the brain. There are imaging studies, there's neuropsychological studies, meditation matters. It can affect your physiology in a very positive way. There's a Harvard study that showed when you take people who don't know how to meditate and you teach them how to meditate, six weeks later you do a functional MRI, you do a brain image, you find that they have a 10% increase in cortical density. So meditation fooled us. We had, when we started studying it, we thought it would like calm the brain. In fact, it doesn't do that at all. It fires it up, especially the most human thoughtful part of you, your frontal lobes. A huge benefit of that is you're gonna make better decisions because the front part of the brain is all about impulse control and decision making. So doing it on a regular basis can totally help your health. Meditation wakes up our higher reasoning, which is the very thing we seem to have lost in our march towards progress. We can use this powerful tool to wake up and make better decisions for our collective future. An ignited mind moves the body into action. We're all caged animals today. We aren't getting outside enough. All of us need sunshine, which gives us vitamin D. We uh, also need fresh air, and we need to move multi-directionally using our whole bodies, full body compound movements. You know, we're, we have sunlight all around us, and yet we wake up in the morning uh, in our houses. We um, quickly jump into our cars. We commute to work. From there, we park in an underground a parking lot maybe and then and then go into the building and then we're, now we're sitting in an office building all day sitting and staring at a two-dimensional screen that shines artificial light back at us is a far cry from what we evolve doing every day so i've gone into the woods and i've tried to survive i've tried to forge for myself and i'll tell you you're you have to do a lot of work you have to build your own shelter you have to gather your own food you have to prepare your own food it takes a lot of energy you will perspire. You will exert yourself. One of the biggest problems that we're facing right now is that we sit way too much. There's so much science behind this. Sitting makes your lower back inflamed. Most people have really poor posture. It's, it's really bad for you. In fact, there's studies showing that there's a greater risk of diabetes and heart disease, depending on how many hours you sit in a chair. Our ancestors used to lift things and climb trees and do all sorts of things that made us feel alive. Today we find that we're surrounded by furniture and our environment almost teaches us to be lazy and a lot of us can't even touch our toes. But again, historically, if you look at the expectations of our hunter-gatherer genes, they look for us to give an all-out effort on occasion. The net effect of that was a pulse of growth hormone and testosterone. Um, this is part of the survival of the fittest concept where you survive that episode and the body responds by getting stronger. It all boils down to better choices. Do we move towards more life or away from it? Do we wake up or remain in a dreary sleep? Much of this is the key to how we evolve and express as individuals. We were constructed this crucible, this DNA recipe that expects certain behaviors and now we've created a society and technology that takes a lot of that away. How do we reaccess that? Get some time hiking, get some time on the, in the forest, get some time on the water, get some time swimming, get some time with nature because those energies become part of your intrinsic body of knowledge. John Muir was a renowned conservationist in the early days of American history. He fought to preserve our natural heritage and kept sacred that which we cannot afford to lose. 
Humanity has entered a unique point in history, what many are terming the Anthropocene, where humans are the dominant species on the planet. Unfortunately, what that also means is we're encroaching upon the very systems that allow us to survive on this planet. Um, these incredibly diverse ecosystems that make this a beautiful and amazing thriving world are under threat right now. Having touched our roots in Africa, learned primitive survival skills and how to live off the land, we decided to embark on another journey into nature using today's technology in order to bring past and present together with balance and respect. We set out on the famous John Muir Trail, 220 miles of pristine wilderness in the Sierra Nevada mountains of California. This land was preserved as a result of his efforts, a forward-thinking man who understood the value of nature, the value of preserving this legacy for generations to come. Technology can work hand in hand with nature, we had carbon fiber walking poles, energy efficient stoves, LED headlamps, solar chargers, water filters, and super light shelter. It was an epic journey that brought the best of modern technology into the wild, leaving nothing behind. So much media today makes nature out to be this scary, threatening thing that's out to get us. But in reality, it's not man versus nature. We are nature. It's who we are. It's where we come from. Um, and it's our source. It's our life. Um, and it's, it's what causes us to survive and thrive on this planet. Right on the other side of survival is growth and room for play. Right on the other side is a bright future that's well thought out and respectful of our environment. So the question becomes, how do we take back this legacy and walk a path where our notion of progress is measured more wisely with the conservation of the natural world and all the life teeming around us? How can we return to a life of healthy symbiosis so we can thrive and live harmoniously within the natural world? Mother Earth, the ancient, lush, fertile mother of all life on this planet. A living, breathing organism of which we are part, taking the rays of the sun and bringing forth life. It's one of the great miracles, if not the greatest. Life itself growing and perpetuating, coming forth and blossoming. of the basic instincts of animals. It's to find a partner, procreate, and bring up kids. Hello, welcome to life. What are we doing? Why are there six billion of us? Because we're doing it pretty well. It's normal and healthy to be able to reproduce. And when you can't get pregnant, we have to ask, what's wrong? Millions come into our world daily. And much of the concern on the international level is in response to how we're going to feed all these people. How on earth are we all going to make it on this planet? There's a paradox happening right now. On the one hand, we have unprecedented levels of population growth. On the other hand, we have unprecedented levels of infertility. We've expanded to the far reaches of the planet, and now we've run out of Earth. This is it. The question of our time becomes, how do we live together when there's nowhere left to go? How do we prosper and not kill each other over limited resources? As an organism, our first and primary goal is to reproduce the continuation of the species. When that breaks, that is a sign that we are really biologically at a dangerous place. Fertility is a leading indicator of the health of an organism, and when one in eight of us doesn't have enough health to reproduce, even in their reproductive years, that is a terrifying data point, and it's one we need to do something about, because next generation, it won't be one in eight, it'll be one in four, and then one in two. 
Our ability to procreate is quite literally tied to our very survival. And now that's coming into question. Is it nature naturally controlling the overgrowth of a species or are we missing something? We're facing an epidemic of endocrine disruptors that are robbing us of fertility. Women are having trouble with their eggs, with egg quality. They're having more miscarriages, difficulty getting pregnant because of the toxins that we're exposed to. Endocrine disruptors are everywhere from dry cleaning chemicals and antibacterial hand soap to even the fluoride in your toothpaste. It's important to appreciate that each of these different substances can affect different organs and disrupt our fertility. An animal that cannot reproduce in nature is in trouble. And when we look at our world, in the developed world, we're seeing an enormous rise in infertility. Could the cause be all of the chemicals that we've dumped into the environment? The food that we eat, the cosmetics that we use, and our household cleaning products all contribute to whether we are healthy or not. When a species is healthy, nature rewards it with fertility. The ability to produce offspring is a critical piece in the flow of life. The transition into this world we're finding is critically important and carries a deep level of communication with the world of our parents. A transfer of information and immunity through the medium of life. There's so much genius in the handoff of life from mother to child. We're just beginning to understand the science of this. It's a beautiful process, birth. It's absolutely amazing. And you know, the mom prepares for it by changing the colonies in her intestinal tract of certain organisms, microbes. And then the fascinating thing is that when the baby comes out through the vaginal canal, it's bathed in a lot of the colonies the mother has been harboring that have probably been passed on from her mother. And those colonies will actually get on and in the nasal passage and lungs and intestinal tract of that child. Now, these bacteria will start triggering your immune system to create certain defenses. If you think about it, this is the first vaccination that you get. This is nature's way of vaccinating you and, and making your immune system be able to cope with an atmosphere that's not sterile anymore. Women who are counseled by their physicians to have a cesarean section, maybe a scheduled C-section because of convenience, either on the part of the patient or the physician, often aren't told about the health consequences of not having a vaginal birth, not having that inoculation with the mother's microbiome through a vaginal birth. All these people that were born by C-section and were given antibiotics since they were kids, are now reaching an age in which they're loaded with problems. Autoimmune diseases and all kinds of, of, of diseases that actually, in my opinion, stem from the early and repeated use of antibiotics. And when the mom breastfeeds, the mother will actually have the third largest component in her breast milk not be available to her baby. It'll only be available to one specific organism called Bacteroides. It's a bifidobacterium infantis. And that one organism elegantly cleaves the sugars in the mother's milk and feeds off of it and thrives more than anything else. And it turns out by having that specific organism in that naive intestinal tract of a baby protects it from pathogens, it allows it to produce certain nutrients. It's inoculating that child's intestinal tract with the proper microorganisms within a very brief window of life, the first few days, if not weeks, after being born. If that never happens, we're seeing that your entire life is more challenged. Seeing children sick at such a young age does not bode well for our future. It's scary. We need to change the direction that our culture is headed. The go-to solution has been to treat everything with antibiotics, and now we're creating drug-resistant bacteria. To fix it, people are rushing to buy probiotics, but nobody's clear on the complexity of the microbiome and how to truly restore it. 
So for us to assume that we can intervene in certain illnesses with things like antibiotics, or we can intervene with specific probiotics at this stage, I think is a little premature. I think it's, it might be even to a point of being disrespectful. What I see is nature deficit disorder for our children. You know, kids want to run around in the dirt. They want to have fun outside. They're curious about the world and they want to be able to explore. When we contain them, when we've got the hand sanitizer that we're using constantly and they're not digging in the dirt and getting all these happy bacteria into their system, we're cutting them off from life itself. You know, I grew up on the streets of New York and we went out and we played and we played in the dirt. We got muddy and we got dirty and we came home and we were fine and we rarely got sick. We didn't have antibacterial soaps and we weren't germ phobic and we did just fine. As a mother and a doctor, I'm really concerned about this because our kids really want to thrive in nature and we're cutting them off. It's got biological effects and it also has psychological effects. So a lot of parents are having bouncers babysit their children. But that's not really very good because the bouncer's doing all the work. What we really want is the baby's brain and the baby's muscles to be doing the work. And if you don't properly activate the cerebellum, the cerebellum back bottom part of the brain is totally connected to your frontal lobes. And so you can't develop one without developing the other or kids end up with learning problems. So women, especially new moms, are in an incredibly powerful position, a position of leadership, especially with the market, based on how they spend their money. So not only do you have an incredible intuition which you can trust, you have the power to shift the way marketers market to moms and to help be a part of bringing healthier, less toxic products to the market so that we all have better choices. Close contact with the earth that's how we evolved. A balanced life in touch with nature and the environment around us. Healthy, happy kids become healthy, happy people. We've all heard the saying, you are what you eat. So let's take a proper look at our food and how powerfully it can impact our health and our future. You know, we evolved eating a very different diet, a diet that was wild, wild animals, wild plants, wild berries, wild nuts and seeds, things that we found in nature that fed us. And we found that those foods, which we evolved on, are very nutrient dense, much higher in fiber. 100 grams a day we used to eat of fiber compared to maybe eight to 15 for the average American now. Much higher in vitamins and minerals, much higher in omega-3 fats, much higher in all sorts of phytonutrients and phytochemicals because wild plants are much richer in these disease preventing and, disease and health creating compounds. So the diet that we eat is not the diet that we ate and that has huge implications for our health and for the planet. Food is information. Yes, it's fuel, but food also provides information to your, to your cells and to, at, the, at the level of the genes. It turns genes on or off, depending on uh, you know, what's in the food. So always going back to this notion that uh, if you look at evolution and you look at how we ate for two and a half million years, it worked that long. It's not working now. Let's go back to the way it was. Every single culture and civilization that has existed on Earth has had a culinary and herbal tradition that we cannot afford to lose. In fact, those traditions are loaded with treasures, treasures that can educate and guide us into the future. You know, when I was a kid, we used to visit my grandparents' house, and I don't remember even seeing food that came in plastic and packages. I mean, they would go to markets, and they would bring home foods that had color and would spoil if you left them out. Um, by the time I went to college, everything came in plastic and boxes and cardboard and, and had labels and barcodes and ingredients I couldn't pronounce. It's a whole different world now. When you look at the foods that we're reacting to, they're foods that are relatively new to our food supply, anywhere from five to 10,000 years ago. Soy is only a couple thousand years old, and then gluten and dairy and corn, five to 10,000 years old. And with a lot of these things, 
they've been changed. Look at gluten, it's been hybridized, so it's totally different than what we might have eaten 10,000 years ago. And we've domesticated animals, and now we're feeding them soy and GMO corn. So we've totally changed this food supply into something our body doesn't recognize. It's like Frankenfood. Frankenfood, fake food. We've outsourced the making of our food to corporations who started cutting corners, adding chemicals, and altering the genes of what we eat. They've now intercepted the purest transaction we have with life and nature herself. If you take you are what you eat to the next level, then you have to think about what your hamburger ate too. A lot of us aren't used to having that intimate connection with what we put in our bodies. You know, if you had your own vegetable garden and you're gonna eat your own tomatoes that you grew in your backyard, you wouldn't go out and spray poison on them. Yet somehow when we buy this stuff in the supermarket, it becomes okay that they've been sprayed with all kinds of toxins. When you look at it, one of the key factors of obesity comes from inflammation. So inflammation, when you think about it, is the root of almost every single disease out there. And it's happening because of the food that we're eating. The truth is that food is way more than just calories. It's information. And the quality of the information in the food determines everything about our health and everything about our world. It's the ecology of eating, how we grow our food, how we relate to it, how it affects us, all is connected. If food is medicine, then why is it causing so many people to get sick and morbidly obese? Where have we gone wrong? You know, we've got this fat thing all wrong. Somewhere four or five decades ago, we got this notion that eating fat makes you fat, eating fat gives you heart disease, and we gave sugar a pass. We, we convicted the wrong man, Your Honor. Fat was never the problem, it's always been sugar. Your brain is made primarily of fat, and when you fuel with fat as your food source, then you actually get this exceptional mental clarity that you're not used to if you're burning sugar most of the time. You know, we've just fallen into this mythology that cholesterol is the problem, that cholesterol causes heart disease, that we all need to be worried about our cholesterol, and we've just gone after the wrong molecule. Cholesterol is needed for the brain. It's needed for thinking and memory, and it's needed to make your sex hormones out of and your vitamin D out of. Uh, Low-fat diets are a disaster for uh, brain function. People know high cholesterol is not good for you, but most people don't know that low cholesterol is associated with homicide, suicide, and depression. If fat is critical in your diet, you just want healthy fat. Well, there is such a thing as good fat and bad fat, but it doesn't break down the way most people think with saturated fat as a bad fat and everything else is good. Bad fats are damaged fats. They're fats from oils that we've used in restaurants and overused and reheated and reheated and form carcinogens and, and all kinds of compounds that are very bad for our health. Good fats are the natural fats that are found in whole foods, whether they're saturated, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, doesn't matter if they come from whole foods, we have nothing to fear from them. Our bodies evolved to crave saturated fat because it's so important for forming hormones, for making the brain, and even for our cell membranes incorporate saturated fat. However, we did not evolve to use trans fats. Trans fats don't exist in nature in almost any cases. Certainly the artificial trans fats that we manufacture today have never existed. So when we eat those, our body sees them as healthy saturated fats and tries to use them. Omega-6s are inflammatory. They're pro-inflammatory. They feed the fire of inflammation in your body. Omega-3s are protective. They're a type of fat that's really good for you. It's good for your brain. It's the most proven supplement and healthy fat for you. But the key to human health is having them be in balance. Omega-6s are found in vegetable oils, corn oil, safflower oil, all the vegetable oils we've been told to consume so much of. Omega-3s are found in fish oil and flax oil. The balance between these two is critical for human health. We make inflammatory compounds out of the omega-6s and we make anti-inflammatory compounds out of the omega-3s. They need to be in balance. Uh, the ideal ratio between those two is about one to one, maybe as high as four to one in favor of the inflammatory omega-6s, no more than that. Current research shows we're consuming 16 to 1 in favor of the inflammatory omega-6s and probably more in certain parts of the country. This is a disaster waiting to happen and we're seeing the results of this inflammation in our disease states right now. Inflammation hits your brain first. You start thinking more slowly long before you get cardiovascular disease or fatty liver or the other problems that are caused by these trans fats. 
Now, protein and fat normally go together, and because of this crazy fear we have of fat, we've also cut back a lot on our protein, particularly women, and we need protein. We need protein to build our biochemicals, our hormones, our bones, our muscles, our structures in our body, uh, to have vitality, to speed up our metabolism. So protein is very, very important as long as it comes from clean sources. We can get protein from animals, of course, and I definitely recommend that we get the cleanest sources possible, grass-fed bison or grass-fed cow. However, how about getting a larger percentage of protein from plants? we can get great sources of protein that have a lot less impact on the planet from plants than from animals. So I'm a fan of hormone-free, antibiotic-free, free-range grass-fed meat because it provides so many vitamins and proteins that are just critical. You know, the more protein you have, typically the more stable your blood sugar is. Uh, protein's not the problem, it's sugar. So we're standing in the middle of the biggest health crisis in the history of our human species. It's called diabetes, and it's a spectrum of imbalance from a little bit of belly fat to prediabetes to type 2 diabetes. And today, it affects one out of every two Americans. And it's mostly ignored. 90% of the people who have this condition have no idea. Their doctors don't know how to diagnose it, and they don't know how to treat it. It's not rocket science, sugar makes us fat. If you eat too much of it, you will probably get fat too. The thing that most people don't understand though is that it's not just sugar, but also the way that your body metabolizes carbohydrates. So things like bagels, breads, donuts, whole grains even, are turned into sugar in your body and if you overload yourself with sugar, you're going to get fat. For two and a half million years, uh, we didn't eat processed foods. We ate things from the ground or picked from the tree or things that we, that we foraged or killed. Um, it was all natural. I mean, that's really the, the, the essence of all this. It was all natural. And now, just in the last hundred years, with uh, processed foods and with the ability to extract um, carbohydrate and refine it to such a degree that it, instant, it turns into glucose in your bloodstream instantly, and with all of the artificial sweeteners and, and uh, other toxins that we find in food, uh, we're throwing our bodies a curve that, that they can't handle. If you take a bird's eye view of a supermarket, you see all these aisles, you know, 90% of what is being sold that people are consuming, and if it's in the supermarket, it's because people are eating them, right? Supermarkets are not in the, in the money losing business, right? So when you look at a supermarket, you see 90% of their products coming in boxes, jars, tubes, cans, bags. This is not found in nature. This is not food. This is edible products. Edible, manufactured, chemically altered, processed um, stuff. It's amazing how so many people continue to make poor food decisions. When we see people make the same mistakes when they probably know better, we have to suspect something a little more serious. The answer is very simple, addiction. And I'm not talking about this metaphorically, literally. The biology of food addiction is very well worked out. In fact, scientists have found that sugar is eight times more addictive than cocaine. Eight times, it's almost unbelievable. But in animal studies, they've given the rats a choice between intravenous cocaine and sugar. They always go for the sugar. And if they're already addicted to cocaine, they still go for the sugar. Same biology happens in humans. You know, if the government subsidized cocaine the way they subsidized sugar, and supermarkets sold it, and companies marketed it, that would not be okay. But yet, for some reason, it's okay when we pour this stuff down our throats and feed it to our children. It's the worst stuff in the world. Stop eating it. It's a physical addiction that now drives how food is produced, marketed, and labeled. They are manipulating and exploiting us and our children. There's a nasty loop between three key factors. Number one, TV, which delivers misinformation about food and sugar. Number two, frankenfoods, the big food industry, which stands to profit from it. And then number three, the medical industry, which makes a ton of money 
from the chronic diseases that result from bad food. It's one thing to use deceptive marketing practices on adults like us, but one thing that really fires me up is when I see that used on children. It's almost like they want our kids to get hooked on the worst of foods that make them the most money from the youngest age possible. As a mother, I want people to have my children's best interests in mind. And yet I can tell you, even politicians are bought off. They're bought off by big food, they're bought off by hospitals. They are not motivated to relieve our suffering. Not all scientific advancements should be considered progress. Who's holding the line here? Corporations who are willing to poison us and biochemically enslave our kids as sugar addicts? Do they get to call the shots and tell us what's right? These companies constantly cut corners and then they use cultural icons to sell food that is extremely low quality and we just buy their junk anyway. You just have to look at that to then see and understand what is going on with health in humanity. You know, the more sophisticated, the more scientifically advanced, the more industrialized a country, the more chronic diseases and the more complicated those chronic diseases are. Sex is natural. Sexual reproduction is how nature reproduces. Plants, birds and bees, corn. But in 1996, something new happened. They started to genetically engineer soy, corn, cotton, canola. They started taking genes from viruses and bacteria, putting it into a gun, shooting those genes into plates of cells, cloning those cells into crops creating genetically engineered crops that produced their own toxic insecticide, that withstood doses of herbicide. And this they called progress. The process of genetic engineering itself caused massive collateral damages, causing an increase in known allergens, introducing new allergens, not to mention the insecticides. And this, we think, is the major cause of a lot of rise in a lot of diseases and disorders that we're seeing. So when we take people off of these genetically engineered foods, as thousands of doctors are doing now, they report people getting better from immune system problems, gastrointestinal problems, infertility, a whole host of diseases and disorders. There's this counter argument that we need to mess with our food in order to feed the world's growing population. That the only way we can meet these needs is to dump poisons on our land and degrade the quality and purity of our food sources so we could all be addicted to sugar and sheepishly accept rising healthcare costs. GMOs generally reduce yield. One crop has found that increases yield by 0.3% per year, far less than natural selection could do. But when you look at what sustainable agriculture can do, they looked at more than 12 million farms in 50 countries, and they found it increased yield by 79%. And for staples like corn and potatoes 100 percent. So this concept that we need to have genetically engineered monocultured agriculture in order to feed the world is actually working against feeding the world and taking money away from more appropriate solutions. When we look at what sustainable agriculture is really based on, it's using a natural system and working and enhancing that natural system and cleansing that system of dangerous chemicals and compounds. Everything from what's in the air to what comes in the food has an impact on human health. And what we're seeing now in the fields across the United States, now across the globe, is we're having a shift in something called the rhizosphere. It's the soil microbiome environment. Why is that important? We would not have life on this planet without microorganisms. You know, they form root nodules on plants, so then the plants can then interact with the minerals in the soil, take them into their own structures, and pull them up their stalks into their shoots, fruits, leaves. So if we can't get the minerals from the soil into the plants, we most definitely will have compromised nutrition 
in our end product. And when we eat this nutritionally empty food that's lacking in so many important nutrients, we wind up eating more of it because our bodies are starving for the nutrients that aren't in the food to the first place. Without healthy soil, we are lost. We have no idea what the intricate balance of life is in there. The soil has masterfully sprung forth life on this planet for millennia. Now, we're willing to allow the people who brought us DDT and Agent Orange to kill off the life on this planet and control our food supply? So the quality of our food has been um, degrading over the years. So in sustainable agriculture, we work to build a system where nature can sustain itself. The next level of that we call agroecology, where it's an agricultural ecological system that works in harmony with nature rather than working against nature. The United Nations published a study in 2010 that said that if we switch the world to agroecological techniques on the same footprint of farming we have, we can double world food production and over about 10 years begin to heal all the excesses of the chemical era. This comes from the United Nations. If the Frankenfood-sponsored media tells you otherwise, you may want to wonder why. Healing the excesses of the chemical era. That sounds good for the planet and it certainly sounds good for our ailing bodies. You've heard the word heirloom. Heirloom seeds are old-fashioned, open-pollinated seeds that were kept by man for many generations because they had unique flavor and, and they were very healthful. Now in our modern times, we have genetically modified seeds. Many times, those seeds cannot be reproduced. They're, they're covered by contract. This, the farmer can't even save those seeds. And those seeds are only produced to have the effect of benefiting from not being killed by the chemicals that are sprayed on them. But what are they doing for our health? That's the unanswered question of our time. So if we were to take the stress away from a plant by giving it fertilizer, by spraying weed killers around the plant, by putting fumigants on the crops so there's no insects attacking it, the plants become lazy they produce less of these incredibly important phytochemicals, plant chemicals. Fake food needs poison to kill off all of the life around it. And we have to ask ourselves, why are we doing this? Like, why do we need to kill off these pests? Really, we need to get rid of the fake food. It's more important to learn what not to eat than to learn what to eat, because if you just eliminate certain foods from your diet, you, your chances of getting better, even if you feel good already, are great. It's far easier to get these out of your system to reduce exposure than to live with the misery of having them ruin your health. This applies not only to the plants that we consume, but also the animal products. Industrial farming has split the plants and the animals. On one side, you've got the cows in their feedlots by the thousands. On the other side, you have monocropped farms. What we're looking to do is go back to the logic of the traditional family farm, where the chickens eat the cockroaches, where the pig eats the waste, where the cow mows the grass, and the goats clear new areas for fruit trees. So we're not using the herbicides, we're not using the pesticides, that might come from the industrial chemical industry. This can be protective on many different fronts, not just to the human cells that may be damaged by these chemicals, but to the water, the air, the microbes in the soil and in our own bodies, because no one's really looking at the effects those chemicals are having on the smallest of the populations that might be some of the most important inhabitants on planet Earth. Since organic agriculture works so well, how did big food hijack our food supply? The food industry in the 50s created a deliberate culture of convenience. They literally have hijacked America's kitchen by creating foods that were designed to be easy to make and they made it a chore. They made it something bad to be in the kitchen cooking food. In 1900, 
2% of meals were eaten outside the home. Today, over half of our meals were eaten outside the home. And the meals that are eaten in the home usually are made in a factory that come in a box, a package, or a can that we heat up in a microwave. America has lost the art of cooking. We've raised two generations of Americans who have no idea how to cook. We've outsourced our cooking to corporations. We've outsourced our cooking to the food industry. We need to get away from processed, industrialized, domesticated foods that are making us weak and sick in favor of foods that we've been eating for a very, very long time in their most natural, in the true sense of the word, state. And that's what I call the wild diet, where you're eating foods that were recently alive and well, mostly plants. Life supports life. The natural flow is that of growth and reproduction. The good news is that we can quickly turn this around. So it usually takes about three days. That's it. If someone nails their diet right, it'll take three days and they can have a major shift. So if you're going from a junk food diet laden with high fructose corn syrup and fried foods and nothing that looks like it was growing on a tree, and you start eating a whole foods-based organic diet, watch what happens. It's amazing. Now, depending on how far down the rabbit hole you've gone on one end, it might take longer, but your cells notice changes and your body can start shifting in a very short period of time. So I found myself a desk jockey, overworked, fat, sick, inflamed, and basically my doctors just threw pills at me every time I came in and said that I was sick, I needed to eat less and run more. And so more of that made me more fat, more sick. It wasn't until I took my health into my own hands started living in a clean way, the way that our ancestors used to, going back to our roots, that the, the fat just melted off and all of a sudden I had this incredible vitality and energy that I'd never experienced before. The truth is, we have all the power. Each and every one of us makes a choice with every purchase we make. As above, so below. As we start making better decisions and taking the toxic poisons out of our lives and our environment, we start to come to life again. This gives us the personal power to get our energy back, get more active and involved in the world around us. It helps us start changing our personal surroundings to better support our lives, our planet, and our collective future. The most powerful tool you have to change your health, to change the health of the environment, to change our economy, to literally change our whole world is your fork. What you put on that every day, three times a day, is the most important decision you have to make. You need to vote with your fork and you get to vote every day, three times a day. So make that vote count, count for you, count for your family, count for your children, and count for our planet. You know, you and I are the consumer. We have the power and we're voting with our money every time we make a purchase, every time we eat a meal. Are we going to support the companies that are poisoning us and our kids and the planet, or are we going to support the companies that are actually doing the right thing? It can feel so challenging when you're bombarded with all this information about the harmful things and the toxic things and doomsday with the climate and all this scary information. But what we can remember is that there are a lot of people out there doing awesome things and we can seek out their information, buy their products, support them, share what they have to say, and we can all play a role in helping restore a sense of balance, consciousness, and mindfulness in our environment and in how we live with it. One move corrects everything and that's the return to the sacred that nature is sacred, that rocks are sacred, that plants and trees are sacred. That one step of reverence for all life can correct so many imbalances in our thoughts, words, and deeds. Simply moving forward into the future with reverence can create sustainability. It can create an amazing wonder and awe and appreciation for all those amazing technologies that we have, but also begin that thought process that puts us in a balance so that that technology doesn't hurt the earth but can actually help the earth.
And, and ultimately, this isn't about recreating or reenacting some ancient history. This is about accessing modern technology, but recognizing that we are this, this ancient being living in a, in a modern society. The, the end result is you can have it all. You can have the, the happiness and the satisfaction and the contentment and not have to give up the technology and the convenience and the other wonderful things that we have created for ourselves. As we wake up and we find more clarity, you find that doing the right thing just gets easier. The first step is to give your body food, food that has been recognized for thousands of years, food that is healthy and comes from nature. I see so many people who are tired, who are moody, who have joint pain, that they just think this is normal for them. And then when they go back, and they start to eat like we did thousands of years ago. Basically, they're returning to their origins. It's a transformation. They feel amazing. So as you're eating fresh, whole foods, you're getting your food locally from a, a butcher or farmer, and your plastic levels go down, watch your energy and watch your weight. Because what happens is, once those levels go down, usually the body weight goes down too. I mean, we need to disrupt the food system. We need to completely disrupt it. And the best way to do that is through buying into your local decentralized food producers and food suppliers, through community-supported agriculture, through farmers markets, through local co-ops that sell local foods. And sometimes it's a little bit more expensive, but you know what? The quality's better, you need less of it. The reason why junk food is so cheap is because corn, soy, and wheat, and other monocrops are subsidized by the government. How about we take those funds and we put them into local organic farms to grow healthy food for healthy people? There are people out there funding initiatives to create exactly that change. They need our support. I believe that the power of change happens in community. That people banding together, doing things together, makes a huge difference. It's the power of social networks to change people's behavior, to get people aware of the lies that they're being told by the food industry and our government so that they can, in fact, change what they're doing. They can change what's happening in their homes. They can take back their kitchen. I think it has to happen where we live. It has to happen in our homes, in our kitchens, in our workplaces, in our schools, where we eat, live, work, play, and pray. That's where this has to happen. Since you have a prefrontal cortex, since you can think as a human, if you have a dollar, and you can spend it somewhere, spend it on the food that comes from someone who is not also harming you at the same time. When you do that, we can turn things around. You are gonna spend the dollar either way, spend it in the right place, and you and even your children and your grandchildren will benefit from that. You know, it's just not okay to sleepwalk through life and feeling fat and tired and looking 20 years older than you really are. There's so much light on the other side of that. We're only a few decisions away from a light filled with optimism and joy and vitality and well-being, and we need to take our power back right now. A classmate of mine from medical school, she's a physician, was doing an internship at a biodynamic farm in Washington State. And she showed up her first day and her boss said, we're gonna work on the tilth today. And she said, what's tilth? And he took a handful of the soil and he held it up to her and he said, this is good tilth. It's kind of like when you see a patient who's got good chi. You want soil that has good chi. So I feel like that is the connection between our planet and our health. When you really take care of the soil of your body, your inner ecosystem, you're also taking care of the planet. You're improving the soil that we grow our food on that feeds us and feeds our children. One of the most interesting things that's happened in humanity is the era of chemicals and agriculture. That era is really coming to a close because the Earth's systems cannot sustain those chemicals. And where we really see it is in your body. The food that you put into your body is the key. If you buy the best quality food, you can afford it because it's actually inexpensive because it's, it's primary health care. Good food is the key to a healthy life and enjoyment. That flavor cannot be achieved in a chemical system, but an organic system can bring that flavor forth by working with nature and building a healthy complex soil that supports the food. We're part of something much bigger than we can ever imagine. This thing called life is intricate and gorgeous and massive. We are but a small part of it, but we can have a massive influence on it. 
nature has always guided us and can guide us into the future. All we need to do is open up our intuition and instincts. It is up to us to leave a legacy and that legacy will grow. And if we do it correctly, we will pass on the right legacy. And I think what it all boils down to is one simple thing, respect. When we realize that nature isn't something out there beyond the city limits where the wild things roam, but it's actually in us, it's in our bodies, it's in our homes, and we're intricately connected to this amazing web of life that is planet Earth, then something shifts. And we realize that respect and love for our planet is actually protecting our own future. So a return to our origins is our hope. That is the excitement. If we can learn from the wisdom of multiple generations, if we can bring ourselves back into that space of honor and gratitude and appreciation and awareness of the environment around us, we can bring ourselves to an entirely new level. We are the people we've been waiting for. It is on us to bring balance, and it starts with the simple decisions we make every single day. Together, we will thrive and inspire generations to come. Let this be the time they write about in the history books, the time humanity woke up and got it together. Welcome to a brighter future.